busy day trying to run the computer without Chuck being here <laughs> and uh, trying to get ready for a lesson this morning uh, when we got word about 8.30 this morning. So uh, good thing I keep a few on hand. Appreciate the reading of uh, uh, 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 5. Uh, it's something that we'll be getting into here in a few minutes. We welcome our visitors. We invite you back every opportunity you have. Uh, please study right along with us as we study God's Word. Uh, Peggy says, so how many lessons you got on frogs? And I told her, I said, at least 12. Uh, this is only the second one, so she's already tired of them. So. <laughs> but we'll see what we can do with them. And uh, no, I'm not going to preach on all of them someday. So uh, I just maybe got one more that I'll use, and that'd be about it. Or will Here's be a poem a few years ago. It went this way. The centipede was happy until the frog in fun said, Pray, which leg comes after which when you begin to run? Well, that racked his mind to such a pitch, he lay distracted in a ditch, now not knowing how to run. Sometimes we get that way. Sometimes we uh, get so bogged down that we get nothing accomplished. And that's what happened to the centipede uh, as in this lesson that we're going to be talking about. Sometimes they get to the point where they just can't move. And sometimes we as congregations get that way in, in our study and, and trying to do what God wants us to do, that we get so bogged down on a certain subject, and that's why I'm going to discuss a few of them, that we don't get anything done. Uh, I know Dan's sick this morning, so don't get the idea that I'm going to talk about getting a new preacher. Uh, he's just sick, so... Uh, and I was told him this morning, I don't want to talk about him, I just talk about congregations as a whole. Sometimes when a congregation looks for a new preacher or a man to work with them, sometimes they get bogged down in what they want, what they're looking for. Sometimes they want a 27, 28 year old man, they got about 50, 60 years of experience, they got a family, not too big, but not too small. Uh, got to be the right size. And, uh, and, and we say, well, how good are you to visit people? Uh, how much personal work do you do? And, and things in that order. And we spend all day trying to question them on, about what they do, how they act, how they behave. And sometimes we put more on them uh, than needs to be. Uh, some congregations look for a minister or a preacher that works with them uh, to be uh, one that runs the congregation. That's not his responsibility. His responsibility, if you look in, in the books of uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus, it states some of the things that a minister or preacher of God's word is to do. He is to be pleasing in God's sight. In Galatians, the first chapter, verse 10, I'm not going to be able to read all of these because of the lesson. I don't want to preach until midnight like Paul did one night. So, uh, But also, he should be preaching towards sinners, trying to save souls. The fact that we are to be preaching to the brethren, we are to edify one another. And of course, Acts the 20th chapter, verses 20 and verse 32. Again, towards the faith, we are to guard against it. And Jude the third verse. Towards the faithful, we are to teach those to be able to teach others. That's in first. There's 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 2. He is to help set in order the congregation. Titus 1, verse 5. Talks about how they were uh, to set in, help set in elders 
of a congregation. The fact that they are not to be crafty or deceitful, they are to convict, they are to beseech, they are to persuade. They are commanded to, to teach God's word as it is. They are to fight for God's word. They are to see that there is no false doctrines creeping into the body of Christ, into the church that will lead those away from the congregation or towards false doctrine, and making us a denomination. They are to be on guard at all times. They are to teach against those teachings that we may hear about that are creeping into other congregations and prepare this congregation or the one they are in from that false teaching that is being spread. They are to remove and rebuke in 2 Timothy 4, chapter, verse 2. They are to exhort. And a lot of times we get the idea that, again, as I say, we, we want to make more out of them than what they are. But please, if you have the opportunity, please sit down and read First and Second Timothy and Titus. Most individuals, and this is what I taught down at Florida College, these chapters, these books, deals with a young man, Timothy, and also a young man by the name of Titus, and Paul was instructing them how they ought to behave themselves as those who were preaching God's word. How they ought to be. How they ought to be an example to the congregation there that they are working with. How they are to, to edify those members and, and, and strengthen them in God's word. The only thing different between a preacher and a regular member of the church is the fact that he has the ability to study more. But actually, when you sit back and think about it, all of our responsibility as Christians are to go out to save souls. We're to teach. We're to exhort. We're to edify. We are to fight false doctrine. We are to fight for the truth. But we hire a man to be able to study more that he can help present this because we all have jobs and sometimes we don't get to sit down and study like maybe we like to. And that can help us in, in trying to, to dig deeper into God's Word than maybe we can at times. And we got to understand that. We need to talk about qualifications of, of elders and deacons. Uh, we can turn to uh, 1 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 1 through 7. We can read of the qualifications of an elder. We can read in 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13, qualifications of deacons. 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 5, again, talks about those who are evangelists. When we study about a congregation that needs to be having elders within them, how many congregations do you see have elders? You want to know why? Because sometimes we ask a question, and just like that uh, frog asked that centipede, uh, which foot moves first when you move? And when the centipede started thinking about it, it bogged him down. He couldn't move at all. Sometimes a congregation We'll read these qualifications and we discuss them to the point where we get nothing done. We can't make a decision upon what needs to be to, to make the congregation right before God. And sometimes we, we get so bogged down in this that we just shove it off to the side and, and leave it for a few years, and then we discuss it again, and uh, we get bogged down again in those topics and, and the qualifications, how far do we go with it or whatever, that we get nothing done. 
I have seen men leave one congregation, go to another because of a job or whatever. Within a year or two, here you're a deacon or an elder. And that helped lead the congregation. And that same individual was in the congregation that is bogged down. And sometimes we got to be careful of this. That we have no, we get absolutely nothing done within a congregation because we, we don't know where to go, how to do it. Again, sometimes an evangelist or a man that uh, preaches God's word and has big capability of sitting down and studying it into a little deeper can maybe help that congregation find men that is qualified to be an elder or a deacon. I know Brother Dan's preached on it. I know Brother Tim Henderson preached on it. Uh, there, there were others that have been in this congregation that have taught on it. There may be an opportunity that we do not have men qualified to be such. Then the next question is, why not? Where's the problem? And we need to be teaching up on it, trying to prepare our young men to become such, to be leaders of the congregation to help guide them to doing what's right before God. And sometimes we, again, we get bogged down. We get tied up in, 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 in uh, mud, uh, in a sense. I was watching uh, Rat Patrol last night, and if anybody ever seen the show, it's two jeeps that goes around and and shooting up the Germans during uh, World War II over in uh, Africa. And one jeep got bogged down because he hit the wrong part of the sand dunes over there. And he was buried up to, to his body. <laughs> he says, oh, what a, what a worst place to get stuck at. And they were standing there trying to dig the sand out so they could get the jeep out. Hey, we're that way. Maybe the congregation is bogged down to the point where we just can't move as we should and we just get nothing done and we need to work on that. Again, it is something that we need to work on and make sure that uh, we're not trying to, to bog down the congregation in something. It's not that difficult at times. But sometimes we make it more difficult than what it is. And we need to be careful that we don't, and that we try to do the best we can at doing God's will. Now, another place we get bogged down is, is marriage and family. Uh, some congregations, and I know those who uh, plan about uh, getting married, uh, some congregations, some ministers do sit down with them and have a good talk with them before uh, carry on this uh, vow that they're going to be taking for each other till death do you part. And they try to train, they try to teach these young couple and get them to understand what to expect, what to look for within their life and get them prepared for this. And sometimes those films and individuals say, well, I can't do all of that. You're crazy. I can't fulfill all of those things. There's books, special lectures, and things on that order. And then, uh, again, we talk about parents, and we'll get that discussion here in a couple of seconds, that every parent can't be a child psychiatrist. <laughs> Don't even try. Believe me. When you're raising kids, it's hard to think to know what they're thinking all the time. Believe me. Because when I had three sons, they all had different personality. I had to treat them all different. Couldn't treat them all the same. And it becomes difficult. 
But when we talk about a marriage relationship, if you turn over to 1 Corinthians 13, chapter, verses 4 through 7, it says, Charity suffered long as kind. Charity envieth not. Charity faulteth not itself. It's not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. That's true love. But there's a lot of individuals who say, well, I can't do all that. You expect me to trust her all the time? For him, he expected me to, to believe and, and, and forgive him for every little thing he does. Maybe he leaves the seat up and, and, or whatever, and I, I'm going to get a divorce for that. Or maybe he eats crackers in bed, or she does, and I can't, I can't forgive them of that. That's silly. You may get into a little argument about what needs to be bought for the house. Well, maybe we need a new sofa. Oh, nothing wrong with this one. I just got it broke in. <laughs> but we have those that will split over something like that. You can't work it out. If you truly love each other, you learn to forgive, you work together. And that's something that we fail to understand. And that's something that we need to teach our, our young folks that are about to get married. That love will teach you to be able to handle all situations. I watched uh, Mr. Rogers last night. It was a beautiful day in the neighborhood. I cried at the end. Because it talks about a loving man that really cared about individuals and kids. And he had one that was a friend that, that uh, was going to write an article about him, and he said, This guy's a fruitcake. Uh, he's crazy. Uh, he's, he's way out there. And he couldn't get along with his dad. And when they finally got a chance and an opportunity to talk to one another and find out what really took place, they reconciled. They didn't understand. And sometimes we need to do that. We need to sit down and discuss. We need to work with one another. We need to take the love and be able to, to learn about each other as we should. In 1 Peter, the third chapter, verses 1 through 7. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that it, if any obey not the word, that they may, also, may without the word be won by the conversations of the wives, while they behold the chaste conversation coupled with fear, who adoring let it not be the outward adoring of plating of hair, and of wearing of gold, and putting on of apparel. Let it be the hidden man of the heart, in, which, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of the meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And after this manner in the old time, the holy women who also trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husband, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, your husband dwell with them according to the knowledge, giving honor unto your wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. We are to treat with one another with respect. We are to, to take care. We are to, to behold one another. Wives and husbands are supposed to, to, to work with each other. For help meets. One is not an object. She's not a slave. 
but she recognized her husband and respect him and the authority he had in accordance to God's will. He's the head of the house. He got decisions to make. And some of them decisions are hard. They may have to sit down and talk with somebody. You're there. You can teach. You can help him. You can help guide him. He used to say every, behind every great man was a great woman. Because they sat down and talked. And they treated one another with respect. And the husband was supposed to treat their wives as a weaker vessel. Now, I'm not saying that all women are weak. Because <laughs> there are some that probably take on three or four men in a fight and, and, and win. <laughs> but we're not talking about that. We're talking about emotion. We're talking about instincts that is built into each one of us in a, in a degree. It's been given to us by God. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verses 23 through uh, 31. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, if as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, gave himself for it, that you may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that you might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. So men ought to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourish and cherish, even as the Lord the church. For we were members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. How many husbands were willing to die for their wives? Think about it. How many are willing to, to give up their lives for her to die? How many are willing to give up anything and everything they can to help her at times? How many are willing to, to, to work extra time and anything they can, maybe help pay for some medication she might need? or uh, surgery, or, or whatever. How many are willing to give up that little extra for her? And how often does a wife willing to, to give up things because she loves her husband? Maybe realize he, some things he needs within this life. How many are willing to do such? The scriptures teach us that we need to be like Christ. Christ was willing to die for the church. He died upon the cross and was resurrected upon the third day. He died because he loved our souls. And wanted all to be able to come to him, repent, be baptized, and raised up as he was. We can read in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Now, I talk to the little ones, the children. I can say, there's no way you can be a child psychiatrist. I rose, raised, helped raise three boys. Each one of them had a different personality. One you could talk to, the other one, uh, you just had to correct a good bit. <laughs> and then the other one was, I could talk to them at times, and then other times, I had to correct them. Depending on what mood he was in, likewise. You couldn't talk to them all the same way. But you had to try to remember which one I could talk to this way, and another one another direction. Another one I have to be a little bit more stern with. 
This is raising children. But children got a responsibility likewise. And the fact is, they need to be obedient to their parents. And uh, there's all type of books, manuals out there uh, that have been written, given about how you ought to raise your ch children. Throw it all away. You know the best way? This thing we call the Bible. Pick it up, read it, study it about how to raise children. They'll tell you. It helped guide us. And sometimes in in my days, Mr. or Dr. Spock, I think it was, uh, when I was first uh, getting into full time teaching, he was out there. It was contrary to everything that God taught. And sometimes you can talk to doctors and they'll give you opinions of what they think. And sometimes they're far off from the scriptures too. In Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and uh, verses uh, three through four, it says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right, that you may be well with thee. Now thou mayest live long upon the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Again, uh, Dan has been doing a wonderful study, uh, especially last Lord's Day and, and the Lord's Day before, about children and, and husbands and wives and how we ought to behave within the church. And sometimes we get so bogged down that again, we get really nothing done within the marriage relationship that, that should be done. Just wake up and make sure we're not bogged down. Personal relationships. Uh, why do you do that? Ever hear that question? Why do you do that? Uh, he looked at me funny. Uh, he didn't sound very happy. <laughs> you ever hear those statements every day? Uh, you know, trying to analyze. Uh, makes us helpless at times. Makes us paralyzed. If we sit back and we try to think about why, why do you do that? Why did he make that statement? What is he trying to indicate? And we get to the point where sometimes we dwell upon those things that our lives get bogged down and we get nothing accomplished. We need to, to understand what we need to do as Christians. In Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 17 through 21, I can pass no, no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men, if it be possible, much as life in you, live peacefully with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if my enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, you shall heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Why do you drive in my, my yard? What's he doing? That's my property. That, that, that's, that's, that's mine. Get off. Well, why did the neighbor build a new fence? But my fence is already up. Or whatever. Or why did he build that a roof upon that garage and let it hang over my property for a couple inches. What's he up to? What does he think he's doing? If we get that way, that's silly. A lot of times it's silliness. 
We act like kids, like grown-ups. Sometimes we put things in our mind that's not even true. We start thinking, he's out to get me. Or what I did, I, he, he's mad at me. Let's see. What did I do? What did I do last a couple of weeks ago? I don't know. He's he just, he just out there and he's trying to get even with me for another reason. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember. We think that way? Why did that guy cut me off in front of me uh, going down the road? What is he up to? You trying to run me off the road or what? Why do we always think the worst of individuals? That's what I liked about uh, that Mr. Rogers movie. When somebody made a statement to him, he, he went, thank you. Thank you for telling me that. And, and he always had a, a polite and, and good sound statement back to them. Well, I watched it, I was like, who lives this way? Then I thought, well, I should be living that way. This is the way I should be, that's the way I should be acting. Just say anything bad, I should be encouraging them. I should be standing for what's right. I, I need to be, be hospitable to them. You, you have a need? I'll be there for you. He went to visit this guy's father as he's on his deathbed. He didn't need to do that. But he's there. And you know what he said when he left? He bent over and whispered to the man and said, you're getting closer to God. Pray for me. Pray for me. I need help. Why can't we be that way? We can. If, if he is able to do such, why can't we? Why can't we do like the scripture says? We'd be good to everyone. No matter what. We pray for them that, that uh, curses against us. We, we're always there for them. And, and, and try to do the things in accordance to God's will. Matthew 22nd chapter, verses 34 through 40. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together, and one of them was a lawyer, asking him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with thy soul, and all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And second is like unto that, I shall love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. Romans 13, chapter, verses 8 through 10. O no man anything but love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit the doctrine, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not still, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, but love is fulfilling the law. And again, in Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 43 through 48, love thy neighbor as thyself. Again, constantly reminding us we're to care about them as I would care about myself. I'm to be good to them. I'm to pray for them. I'm to be there for them. I am to help them in any way I can. Why do we make it so hard? We worry about this country 
and we see the things that are going on, if we all would stand there and go by what God's word had to say, it wouldn't be half the problems that we have going on right now. Half of it, at least. Maybe, maybe 90%. If we just do what God asks us to do, if we just have the respect for one another as we should, do we? Why? We get bogged down in trying to analyze what my neighbor's doing. And we got nothing to do. We drive ourselves crazy trying to figure them out. You know how to figure them out? Be good to them. Get to know them better. You'll find out. You'll get to know them. You may get the realization that you may like them. And you can get along. Work together. Think of the Amish. When somebody loses something, what happens? We all get together and help rebuild it. That's the Christian attitude. That's the way we ought to behave. That's the way we ought to act. And again, sometimes we get bogged down in evangelism. Uh, Jude Miller years ago had five film strips, 12 strips to teach us how to teach others. <laughs> really? Uh, did Paul and Peter have all this training? Did they go to classes? Yeah, they, they were with Christ for about three years, and they understood how they're supposed, supposed to, to talk and, and treat with one another. Our conversation with an individual on the street, sometimes taken over by, by saying hi, and, and something may be going on, you ask a question about what's taking place, and you turn there and you take over. And that conversation can lead to God. Like I said, I don't know how many times that I've been in a store. As a matter of fact, I let a Ford. I went to do an oil change not long ago. And I walked, walked in uh, over here where you can sit and wait. There's four individuals sitting there. You wouldn't believe what they were talking about. They were talking about the Bible. Huh? Talking about the scriptures. I sat there and listened for a little while. Didn't say a word. Then, uh, as they carried on the conversation about their differences and all that, I had to pipe in. I just, <laughs> I spoke up. And we had a decent conversation. Nobody got mad at each other or anything. Just discussed what the scriptures had to say. Did it take training to do that? No, I, I treated them like I knew them for years. And they treated me like they knew me for years. I have no idea who they were. Why is it so hard? <coughs> Why is it so difficult for us to stand there and talk to somebody about God? Why is it so difficult for us to get them to understand why we need to go to church? Why do we act the way we do, or should be acting the way we do? Where's the difficulty? We don't need a bunch of training to, to do personal evangelism. The fact is, if we do God's will, we preach it, we teach it. Matthew 28, after Mark 16, tells us to do what? Go. Teach every living creature. Everybody. What? The gospel. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. But we stand back here and we make it so difficult. And again, we overanalyze. Like that centipede at the beginning of, this, of the lesson. 
centipede started thinking about what fruit, fruit goes first and got so bogged down became paralyzed and could not move or could not do a thing. And sometimes we get that way. And we need to make sure we need to stop this and quit analyzing so much. Do God's will. That's it. It's not that hard. It's not that difficult. But we make it so difficult, we get so tied down. Why? Because we overanalyze. Now we haven't talked much about failing God's will, but the fact is we offer the invitation now to those who have not yet obeyed God and are a member of his congregation. The fact that you must hear his word, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized by immersion, live a faithful life unto death, receive heaven as our own. Nothing hard, nothing difficult. But sometimes we got people who never analyze that. Scared of water, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm not in there long enough to get drowned. I haven't seen anybody drown yet being baptized. But you're underneath the water for two seconds, three seconds? At the most? Why would we make it so difficult? And then there may be one here that has done God's will but fallen away, need to repent and, and ask for prayers for the congregation to, to help strengthen them to carry on. Please do something about your soul before it's too late. You only got two choices, heaven or hell. You make that decision. I can't do anything else for you except help you. Please take advantage of it while we stand and sing song invitation.